Hello everyone! A while back I made a video on How I Met Your Father because I was really impressed with the show, but by then there were only 6 episodes out, so I promised to make a video talking about the entire season after I had finished watching it, and that was a long time ago, but I wanted to get this video out by the time season 2 started. So that's why we're here today, after the release of episode 1 of season 2, to talk about the remaining episodes of season 1 of How I Met Your Father and why I think this show continues to be surprisingly good. Before we get started, because it's been so long since my previous How I Met Your Father video, let me reintroduce you all to the characters of the show. Also, I highly recommend you watch the previous video before watching this one. The main characters are Sophie, who's a photographer, and she met Jesse and Sid in episode 1, on her way to a date with Ian. Ian, who Sophie met on Tinder and thought he was the perfect person for her, but he had to leave to Australia for work the night he went on a date with Sophie and he didn't want to try a long distance relationship with her. We have Valentina, Sophie's best friend of many years, also Sophie's roommate, who met Charlie in episode 1 and has been dating him since then. Charlie is from a high society British family with unlimited wealth, but he left his family due to them being too controlling and just outright terrible to him, so that he could live in New York when he met Valentina though he moved out of Valentina and Sophie's place in episode 3 to live with Ellen. Ellen is recently divorced, she's not used to living in a big city, and she doesn't know how to talk to women after breaking up with her wife. She's also Jessie's adopted sister, who went with Jessie's mom during their parents' divorce, while Jessie stayed with their dad. So they're quite estranged. Jessie's a musician who proposed to his girlfriend Meredith, and she rejected it, which turned into a viral video that haunts Jessie. City, City. <laughs> Sid is Jesse's longtime best friend. Sid proposed to his girlfriend Hannah in episode 1 of the show, and he owns a bar, which is where the gang spends time for most of the show. It's also important to mention Drew, who started dating Sophie in episode 4, and who's very mature, unlike Sophie. Drew is also the vice principal at the school where Jesse teaches music part time. With that out of the way, let's get started talking about these last 4 episodes. One thing that I really like about How I Met Your Father is that every episode has a sort of main idea it explores, and I really like that every episode uses all its characters to show many different aspects of life from many different points of view when exploring these topics. Episode 7 focuses on the job and career side of life, with Sophie being talented but finding it hard to find work due to it being an artistic endeavor and having to fight her way to being successful. My daughter Rivka's bat mitzvah is this Saturday, and our photographer dropped out at the last second. So I had Amber dig through our submissions to find someone halfway decent who'd be available, and that's you. Halfway decent and available. Therefore, she has to settle for less in the hopes that it'll lead to something more. You do a good job on Saturday, and I'll take a look at your artistic portfolio. Oh my god! That would be amazing! We also have Valentina pretending that her job is great and fun because it fits with who she is, with the personality she has and the version of herself that she puts forth. But she's actually miserable at her job. You already have an amazing job. No, I don't. My job is a nightmare. Your job always sounds so fancy and glamorous. Because I make it sound that way. Why don't you just tell me your job sucked? You've always seen me as this badass boss bitch. I I didn't want to pop that bubble. We don't lie to each other, Val. It's part of our code. We have Charlie loving his job after having found his vocation, being a bartender because he wants to help people deal with their problems. But he didn't want to spend years studying to be a psychiatrist. But then he's very worried about not being the best at it once he gets a bad Yelp review. I have horrible news. I have received a one-star Yelp review. Right? Great bar, except for the insufferable British guy. We have Ellen being insecure because Charlie keeps rubbing it in her face that he's found where he belongs, and she hasn't found her calling yet. Bar, so you see, work gives me a purpose mm. and a drive, and the self-esteem of a nerd in Silicon Valley. I mean, just look at all these five-star Yelp reviews I've received. Sid's conflict in this episode isn't about a job but it relates to the procrastination point that's made with Jesse's character, and how hard it is for him to get back to writing music after breaking up with his girlfriend, who was also who he used to make songs with. I couldn't focus today either. So if you called it, I'm scared I'll never write anything good without Meredith. As well as Sid himself feeling anxious about his wedding because of being from India, and how he can't invite people from his life from when he lived there. I've been thinking for a long time that I wanted to have two weddings. One here, one in India, but Hannah, I mean, she's already killing herself trying to plan one wedding, I don't want to overwhelm her. These are all very human reactions and reasons for the conflicts in this episode to happen, 
and the conclusions for every character in the episode treats all of them with the necessary maturity, not undermining how they feel or why they're doing what they are. Valentina is able to come clean about having a bad job, but not lose Sophie's perception of her, which is what she loves about their dynamic. You've always seen me as this badass boss bitch. I, I didn't want to pop that bubble. You couldn't if you tried. You still love me? Yes, of course I do. Sid is able to decide to have another wedding in India despite his insecurities about overwhelming Hannah. I talked to Hannah. She gets it. Okay, do you know how fine she's gonna look in a sari? Hey man, I'm happy for you that you're with the girl that gets it. Tying in with the last episode where Hannah made a point about being consulted on decisions and how asking her would usually lead to an understanding between the two. So all Sid needed to do was keep Hannah in the loop. Ellen is able to accept that she hasn't found her footing yet in New York and that each person takes their own time to find their drive and to fit in somewhere and that, despite her feeling out of place and like she hasn't settled into this post-divorce life yet, she can count on Charlie to be there to support her because she's always there to support him when he needs her. I'm sorry. I was throwing my new job in your face. No, it wasn't fair. But it's okay that you're still finding your footing here. Jesse's conclusion is that his inspiration needed to come from somewhere else, and he finds that inspiration in Sophie, the same way she gets Jesse to be her inspiration for the photo she's going to present in the next episode, which I find a really good parallel. And Sophie's able to do a good job for what could be a stepping stone for her career. I'm impressed. A deal's a deal. Send your absolute best photo to Amber, the one that sums up who you are as an artist, and I'll consider squeezing you into our new Voices show. With the help of Valentina, through her just being honest with Valentina, so they can work together to make it work. Whereas it wasn't gonna work out, Valentina was still hiding her real job from Sophie, and trying to get more followers from the famous girl whose bat mitzvah Sophie was photographing. Every character has a satisfying conclusion, some more elaborate than others, in a simple 20 minute episode also moving the season story along, with Jesse's interest in Sophie building, their careers moving forward and being consistent with the characterization that's come prior. It feels like community in that sense. Even the structure feels like the Dan Harmon story circle structure for his stories, especially because there's a very clear point to this very simple story. As you probably notice, the conclusions for each character's arc were extremely simple, but the point the episode makes is about avoiding dealing with certain problems altogether, despite the answer being a simple one which is a very human thing for people to do when they feel insecure. So Valentina, Ellen, Jesse and Sid are all trying to avoid dealing with the reality of how they're feeling and, most importantly, why they're feeling it, by not talking about it. However, when they do talk about it, it's simple and easy and the hard part was just getting over that anxiety of acknowledging they have these issues and then taking that first step to do something about it. I really appreciate the level of humanity that's put into conflicts like this because it makes the writing feel somewhat effortless. I can completely understand why these characters act and feel this way, and so it makes it so much easier to connect to them on that level. It's quite wonderful. This episode has a few big things that I think are all done really well. For one, this episode plays with what you know about Meredith from before we meet her. Since episode 1, we've known Jesse had proposed to his girlfriend Meredith and she rejected it, and it became a viral video and that's been a big source of trauma for Jesse that he's tried to overcome. With that, the characters of Jesse and Sid have continuously made comments insulting Meredith, so that builds an impression on the viewer's mind that Meredith is an awful person. However, when we do meet her in this episode, the show breaks down that idea it built up in your head by showing she's actually a really nice person. We see, for example, that she genuinely is friendly with Sid, which makes sense because they used to hang out together all the time when she was with Jesse. Wow. What are you doing different to your skin? Well, actually, yeah, I've been using this new alpha hydroxy mask. It's like, no, no. <laughs> this is what you do. You charm people, you suck them in, and then you stop their hearts to a pulp. Then, later on, when Meredith meets Ellen, who's Jesse's long-lost sister, who he hadn't seen since he was nine, she's super excited to meet her. You must be Jesse's sister. He used to tell me so many stories about how close you guys were. What is that character used to do whenever you drank water? 
Told you about Barbara Waters? Yes! This dialogue is so great, especially because of how specific it is. Because it helps you confirm what Jesse said about wanting to reconnect with his sister for his whole life, but not being able to. And it also helps to show how Meredith was a good girlfriend who listened to Jesse and cared about how he was feeling and let him talk about missing his sister. She cared very much about the things that Jesse cared about. So it's really cute seeing her be so excited about meeting Ellen because that excitement comes from knowing Ellen and Jesse are reconnecting now. And then, the last thing this episode does to continue to show how Meredith is not what we were led to believe she was, is explaining what the thing she wanted to tell Jesse was. She wanted to tell him that she signed with a major label to produce her new album, and a single was dropping. The single drops tomorrow, and it's very obviously about me and Jesse. And I think the combo of me having a big song and it being about a relationship could be, you know, a lot for him. But yeah, may maybe it's best coming from you guys. Ellen and Sid kept trying to keep Meredith from talking to Jesse because they were worried what it might do to him. They thought she was a bad person who's bad for Jesse. But this just proves that Meredith cares about Jesse's feelings and wants to make sure he's okay. She truly isn't a bad person. But the main reason I love this is that it also helps to show Jesse saying she was a bad person after she broke up with him was his way of coping. It was all part of the trauma he was unpacking. He didn't want to believe he deserved to have his proposal rejected, which is a topic I'll talk about a bit more when I get into the next episode. But for now, I can say that I love how this continues the trend of having these characters acting very realistically and very human, because that's just how humans react to situations like that. They go into denial, they demonize the person that hurt them, they believe what they want to believe so that it can make them feel better. Another big part of episode 8 is the arc Jesse and Sophie go through. Sophie's trying to get the perfect photo, hoping for it to get picked for the new Voices exhibit, as established in the last episode. But she has no idea what photo would encapsulate her body of work properly. So she takes that day to get working on getting that one perfect photo she needs. Until tragedy strikes. I think this adorable old couple is about to kiss over a steam vent. I, I gotta go! Nothing's broken. With that, she calls Jesse and asks if he has a cheap dentist, which is part of the point the episode's making. Since Jesse and Sophie are both struggling artists, they barely have any money, so they have to save it wherever they can. I feel you, Jesse. I have drained my entire bank account on rolls of film. But you know what? That's just the life of a struggling artist, right? Like, mm -hmm. pour everything into our work, live on the cheap. Here, have some free fruit salad. Ooh, don't mind if I do. It's not fruit salad. These are my cocktail garnishes. And they're delicious. So Sophie having a broken tooth and needing to get it fixed so she can go to an event her boyfriend Drew is hosting at a school is very important, but she has no money to pay for it. So they go to Jesse's dentist and see a bunch of people in the waiting room. And in true sitcom fashion, they use the characters in the waiting room, who were very old, to point out how they've been struggling with money for decades, because they're all pursuing their artistic careers as well. So that's why they need to go to this extremely cheap dentist. I just really thought this novel was finally gonna be my big break. Hey, do you know if Dr. H still gives out free toothbrushes? This line especially drawing a comparison with Jesse, who earlier asked about the free toothbrushes too. You don't happen to have a cheap dentist, do you? <sighs> Thank God. Yes. If he gives me a free toothbrush, you can have it. The reason why I call attention to this, more so than just talking about the arc these two go through in general, is because this feeling of always questioning if you're good enough and being worried you never make it as an artist is a very topical thing for the show to tackle. As I mentioned in the first video, this show really understands how to put modern day struggles into the show without feeling out of touch. The writers truly understand their characters and what living in the 2020s entails. I found this insecurity that both Jesse and Sophie feel regarding their artistic careers very relatable, because I've personally gone through the same thing, where you compare yourself to other people, where you see people who've tried to make it as an artist but failed, and it makes you worried you'll fail too. It's very nice watching a show set in a world supposed to be like the real world, that truly understands how to depict it in a very honest and thoughtful way. Moving on, Jesse and Sophie's arc continues as they're driving to Drew's event. Jesse's car stops out of nowhere, which causes Sophie to hit her face and break her tooth again. Jesse explains that he knew about the problem with his car, but he thought he still had a few months before he needed to go fix it, which again points to their lack of money without explicitly mentioning it. At that moment, Sophie's insecurities truly get the better of her, and she says her and Jesse will end up like the losers at the dentist's office. Being pathetic like this 
for the rest of their lives. When Jesse reassures Sophie that she's definitely going to make it as a photographer. The way you see the world is in, incredible. You're like this insane little ball of joy and hope and optimism. I mean, even today, you, you were eating cocktail garnishes and acting like it was a lobster dinner. That's why I love being around you. And it's how I know the world's gonna love your photos. Because you're amazing. First off, I love that this line goes back to what you would have assumed was a throwaway joke in the beginning of the episode about the cocktail garnishes, which is a very community thing to do, using a throwaway joke or a line later in the episode to add depth and meaning to it. But also, this one line of dialogue is a pretty huge payoff, when you consider the way this season has been building Sophie and Jesse's relationship, seeing as Jesse, especially in episodes 1 and 2, was extremely depressed and pessimistic due to his breakup. But having Sophie around, someone who's always optimistic despite her circumstances, seeing as she's broke, her career's not doing well, she's never had a long-term relationship, she never knew who her dad was, and her relationship with her mom was a nightmare, and yet she's always optimistic that things will work out. That got Jesse to change throughout the season, to become more optimistic, to become more like Sophie, because he admires so much how she views the world, which had been exemplified in episode 3 when Sophie and Jesse talk on the train about their insecurities regarding dating, with Jesse wondering if he should create a Tinder account and Sophie being hesitant to call Drew because of her insecurities regarding relationships. Find my person. I want to so bad and it just keeps not happening. And so in that situation, what Jesse did was say to Sophie the same words of motivation she'd said to him earlier in the episode, when she offered him to help him take a photo for his Tinder profile. Repeat after me, today is the first chapter of my next great love story. Okay, I'm never gonna say that. Okay, Sophie, repeat after me. Today is the first chapter of my next great love story. With Jesse using the optimism that Sophie has and inspires him with to inspire her, which is the same thing he does in episode 8, helping her when she's feeling insecure by just showing how her optimism is inspiring, and that comes through in her photography. With that, Sophie takes a photo of Jesse looking at his car, trying to fix it. Sophie using Jesse as inspiration the same way Jesse did in the last episode when writing his new song. The same way Jesse is inspired by her optimism, Sophie is inspired by his. As you can tell by the references I used, this moment had a lot of build-up, so we could get here and seeing it all come together in a way that comes so naturally in the story works really well, especially paired with what will happen with Sophie and Drew later in this episode. So, after this scene, Sophie and Jesse manage to get to Drew's event, albeit very late, while Jesse's car is getting towed. Drew mentions a full-time teacher position being available to Jesse. You know, Jesse, that full-time music teacher job we talked about comes with full dental. Uh, I'm, I'm good, Drew. Thanks, though. Which causes Sophie to ask Drew why he did that. You know, I get that Jesse wants time to work on his own music. I just, I don't know, I wish he'd stop chasing a pipe dream, you know? I really appreciate that this line of thinking is very in character for Drew, despite how little we know of his character. Considering a big point of insecurity for Sophie when she started going out with Drew was that he's a real grown-up who's got his life figured out and who has a very steady job, it makes sense for his character to believe that's just what you do when you become more mature. You get a steady job and stop chasing pipe dreams. So I do really like that they kept consistent with what little we knew about Drew, with his maturity being his most prevalent trait shown so far. However, it's obviously very disheartening for an artist like Sophie to hear that from her boyfriend. Do you think that me making it as a photographer is also a pipe dream? I think photography is your passion, and that's awesome. But I also think there comes a time in life when you should get a stable job so you can plan for your future or afford a dentist. Sophie's very upset about the conversation, so she goes to Sid's bar and she finds Jesse outside. And so she tells him about the fight she just had with Drew. I guess the way he sees me is pretty different than the way you see me. Oh. Maybe he's not the guy for you. And the two share a climactic kiss. The way to get to this point of the show, where Sophie not wanting to be with Drew, who is, by all accounts, a really good guy, which is further shown in the next episode, 
was very hard, because the show didn't want to turn Drew into a bad guy for no reason, like how much her mother did with Zoe in season 6, to justify her and Ted's breakup. So the show had the task of keeping the characters consistent but finding a way to get Sophie to want to be with Jesse more than she wanted to be with Drew. It managed it wonderfully, because Drew is very in character here, seeing as the show extrapolates his main character trait as a reason for him to not believe in what Sophie's doing with her life, while also showing why Jesse and Sophie would be so good together because they both inspire each other to be better and to confront their insecurities, just because of how they both see the world the same way. The two of them have been beaten down by the world in many ways, and that causes them to want to give up, but they still ultimately see the beauty in the world and strive for optimism, unlike Drew's grounded way of seeing the world. Unlike in How I Met Your Mother, where it genuinely doesn't feel like Robin even wants to be with Ted by the end of season 1, which is a topic I do plan to discuss in my How I Met Your Mother video, because Ted really does come across as extremely creepy in the season 1 finale, here we saw Jesse being into Sophie from the get-go, while having to work through his trauma with Meredith before he was ready to be with Sophie, which, by the finale, he had. And then Sophie growing more and more fond of Jesse until she realizes she likes him. It's just executed really well, and you can definitely understand why these two would want to be together and be a good fit. Again, unlike How I Met Your Mother, which constantly makes the point that Ted and Robin being together makes no sense. However, as you may remember, Meredith wanting to tell Jesse about her new song was a part of this episode. And, as I mentioned previously, he had to work through his trauma with her to be ready to be with Sophie. So episode 9 uses that to create some very interesting conflict. Episode 9 has Sophie deciding to break up with Drew so she can be with Jesse after they kissed last episode, while Jesse stowed by Sid that Meredith came over and her new scene goes out. So he listens to it and the lyrics seem to imply that Meredith regrets leaving Jesse and wishes they were still together. With that, Jesse kind of freaks out and goes talk to Meredith. So he ends up spending the day with her as they play a game where he closes his eyes and tries to guess which hot sauce is which, a game they used to play when they were together. You know I can't resist hot sauce surprise. Now, this once again helps show how Meredith isn't as bad as we were led to believe, but it also helps create the idea that maybe Jess is gonna decide to get back together with Meredith, just by simply showing these two get along well still, while we know Jesse used to think she was the love of his life. Later in this episode, Meredith says she does want to be with Jesse again, which makes Jesse ask why she left, and I really love her answer. But I had no voice. What are you talking about? It's not your fault. Okay, I let you be in charge, but then when you proposed, I finally realized I can't say yes. I needed to figure out who I was as an artist and as a woman, and now I have. This is similar to the subplot in the final episodes of How I Met Your Mother Season 1, where Lily and Marshall split up because Lily's worried she's never going to do anything for herself, so she can't go through with marrying Marshall yet until she figures out who she is by herself outside of the relationship, which is one of my favorite parts of season 1 of that show. It's a very real and human thing to worry your life is passing by you without you even figuring out who you are and what you want. Much like Valentina was worried she was gonna lose her independence if she committed to being with Charlie earlier in the season, which I mentioned in the last video. So really, I don't think anyone can blame Meredith for saying no to Jesse's proposal at this point. Yes, she did hurt Jesse. Yes, she could have handled everything a lot better. But her reason for leaving Jesse was perfectly reasonable, and I really sympathize with it. The last episode did a lot of work to characterize Meredith as the opposite of what we'd heard about her throughout the season. And now, she really does feel like an actual character. The big thing, though, is that this means the fear that Jesse will want to get back together with Meredith and not be with Sophie is real, especially since Meredith asks him to join her on tour. I need a piano player for my tour next month, and I really want it to be you. We can figure things out on the road. Which is truly a problem for Sophie since she'd gone to Drew's place to break up with him. So we get to Sophie's part of the episode. She'd planned to go on a date with Jesse that night, so she was gonna go to Drew's place and break up with him before that. When she's there, classic sitcom stuff happens, meaning she can't break up with Drew right away. So there's a moment when Valentina learns that Jesse went to talk to Meredith and she calls Sophie and tells her about it. Jesse's with Meredith right now. She's got a new song out about regretting their breakup. And he went to see her. Oh. I'm sorry, Sov, but I wanted you to have all the facts before breaking up with Drew. So Sophie listens to the song and sees that it is about wanting to get back with Jesse, 
and it leaves her in this weird place where she knows she wants to be with Jesse, but being afraid he won't want to be with her. And so she doesn't know if she wants to break up with Drew still. However, she does ultimately do it. Are you okay? I, I know this is a lot of... I'm sorry you walked in all this craziness. Drew, uh, your dad could be going to jail. And you're worried about me? Well, of course. You kind of mean a lot to me. Drew. We need to break up. Firstly, I really love how Drew being broken up with doesn't undermine his character one bit. He is still the same great guy we've seen for the whole season. He even apologized earlier in the episode for having said that stuff about Sophie's career in the last episode. I'm so sorry about last night. I was pissed you were late and I let it get the best of me. Oh, man, apologizing feels good. Fighting gives me stress hives. Under this sweater, I'm a mess. And so here we continue to see how thoughtful and caring Drew is. Regardless of whether we see Drew again after this episode, this is good characterization for him as he's put in a position of stress as his dad might be arrested, but he still cares about Sophie. We learned something new about Drew and that makes it harder for us and for Sophie to think that her breaking up with him is a good idea. Should she stay with this thoughtful and loving guy or should she risk being alone and losing Drew if she wants to be with Jesse? However, the reason Sophie uses for breaking up with Drew is better than her just wanting to be with Jesse. You deserve to be with a woman who is 100% sure that you're the guy for her because you are just incredible. And you're not that woman. I'm not that woman. Sophie's decision to break up with Drew isn't born out of selfishness. It's not just because she found a better guy for her. It's because Drew deserves to be with someone who loves him as much as he loves them. Sophie has her doubts about wanting to be with Drew and if she were to stay with him out of being scared of being alone, that would be selfish. Because she'd be doing that knowing she's not sure she wants to be with Drew. Sophie makes the mature decision of breaking up with Drew, knowing she might be left alone and it characterizes her really well as someone who, like Drew, does care about other people's feelings a lot and who isn't selfish. It's a decision that shows Sophie's maturity and definitely shows her growth from when the season began and she couldn't let go of messaging Ian. This is more in line with the Sophie who told Jesse they shouldn't get together in episode 2 because she was a mess, having the maturity to know not to get involved or stay involved in the situation with someone out of a fear of being alone. But now at the end of the season, Sophie isn't a mess anymore, she knows what she wants and she's ready to put herself out there like she did by going out with Drew in the first place. So she's ready to start the first chapter of her next great love story. One thing that always worries me when I make these videos about media that I like is that I'm just describing things, but I hope you all understand what I'm actually saying about this show and what my praise for it is. The show just handles the topic of relationships with incredible maturity, and he uses the characters as they've been established and how they've grown throughout the season to be to either create or resolve certain conflicts in the show. Episode 1 Sophie would never break up with Drew with this level of maturity. Hell, even in episode 4 she was way too insecure to even have an adult and honest conversation with Drew about something that was bothering her. But now she's learned and changed. One of my favorite things in media is seeing a character make a decision that they wouldn't have done when we first met them. Because we've seen the journey for them having changed and it's satisfying to see how far they've come which is part of why I love re-watching shows so much, remembering where everything started to appreciate more where it ends. Getting back to How I Met Your Father, episode 9 ends with Sophie getting to the place for her date with Jesse. I'm a little bit late, so my date's probably already here. Nope, first to arrive. Oh. By this point, we don't know if Jesse is getting back together with Meredith or not. Leaving on that cliffhanger earlier of Meredith asking Jesse to go on tour with her leaves us with this worry that he's gonna stand up Sophie, which is how episode 9 ends. Episode 10 starts off like this. Dear God, I'm being stood up. Sophie, hi. Hi. I am so sorry. I was on the train. I bumped into that guy I got in the fight with. You remember the dad with the two five-year-old breakdancing twins? Anyway, I didn't want a repeat incident, so I got off the train and I ran here. Despite the audience and Sophie feeling like Chessie was going to send her up, once he gets to the restaurant and meets her there, the reaction I had at least was, oh, obviously he's not going to send her up. He would never send her up. The show was playing with your emotions by using the framing of the end of the last episode with the cinematography and music to make you believe Sophie might get stood up. But if you actually think about it, Jesse standing Sophie up would be massively out of character. But the reason the show framing it as if he would send her up is good and not just some silly cliffhanger because it works with Sophie's character perfectly. Even after Jesse arrives, Sophie's still worried Jesse came here to say he just wants to be with Meredith. I want to start this off right. I went to see Meredith earlier today, and I, I, I just needed some closure. I, I hope you can understand that. 
Did you get the closure you were looking for? I did. I'm glad. Me too. Good. It isn't until he says he got that closure that she allows herself to feel calm and sure that she wasn't abandoned by Jesse. This is great because it's showing Sophie's insecurities. We've seen she feels very insecure about dating in general throughout the season. Because of her mom bouncing from guy to guy and always blowing up her own relationships, also due to her never having met her dad, also due to her never having had a long-term relationship despite having just turned 30. And those insecurities come up again and again as things she needs to work on. I mentioned earlier that Sophie isn't a mess anymore, which is true, but she's also not just gonna move on from her subconscious worries and insecurities overnight. So the reason the cliffhanger of episode 9 of her being potentially stood up works well is because older Sophie is telling the story, it's from her point of view. And from her point of view, back in 2022, she thought she was being stood up. Her insecurities got the better of her. The reason the cliffhanger works well is to make the point of Sophie being so scared and anxious about things, to characterize her that way, and also to show how she's definitely not moved on from her insecurities entirely, despite her arc this season. And that's very necessary for us to understand the conflict of this episode moving forward. So Sophie and Jesse sleep together, and Sophie's awake in bed, and here's Jesse say something in his sleep. I love you, Sophie. Sophie freaks out and asks Jesse to leave, saying she has to prepare for the event where her photograph will be presented. Later in the episode, she talks to Jesse at his place to explain why she's acting weird. Last night in your sleep, you told me you loved me. Oh God, I did? I already feel better that we're talking and we can just laugh about this together. Me first. <laughs> that was so crazy. I mean, it's not that crazy. Well, it's not like we're two strangers who just met at a bar. We've been friends for a while now. We've built a solid foundation. I even said no to going on tour with Meredith for you. You did what? She also basically said she wanted to get back together, and both of those things would have been a dream come true a few weeks ago, but hey, I, I didn't even give it a second thought, because I'm crazy about you. Jesse's a romantic, and going through the arc he did this season, it's reasonable to understand why he's so happy and optimistic about this relationship with Sophie. We saw for Jesse how hard it was for him to put himself out there and try to date again. We saw in episode 2 that dating can make you feel hopeless and alone and like you will never find someone who realizes how amazing you are and I don't want to be one of those people who make you feel like that because I actually can see it. For Jesse, Sophie is the only person that sees him for who he is. It's why he managed to write a song for the first time since Meredith left by getting inspiration from Sophie. She makes him feel safe and comfortable and that's why their friendship was so valuable to him. And it's why him telling Sophie those amazing things about her in episode 8 worked so well. We had all this setup and development for how Jesse sees and appreciates Sophie, even if it's not explicit. It may seem like they just started dating, but for Jesse, his love for Sophie has been clear for a while, and it goes beyond just them dating, because he just loves Sophie being his friend too. So it's why it doesn't seem like a big deal to him that he's so committed to her from the get-go. However, for Sophie, someone who has never been in a long-term relationship, someone who, as we saw in episode 6, finds reasons to run away from commitment, due to her insecurities over relationships. Someone who has a hard time addressing her own feelings as addressed in episode three. Fixer became my go-to mode. Especially when I can't figure out how to fix things for myself. When she sees someone being vulnerable, being committed to her like Jessie is, it freaks her out. It's uncommon, it's scary, and it's too fast for her, with all her baggage, to be able to handle. So, as I said earlier, without the characterization showing Sophie's insecurity so clearly, without the season slowly establishing the pieces for this puzzle as to who Sophie is, this episode couldn't work. We needed the setup and build-up of her character to understand her emotions here, and for it to create a conflict that works so well. A conflict based on feelings that are very realistic, but also that are explained in a very thoughtful and honest way. This show is a sitcom for sure, but it knows what to tackle with maturity and honesty. And so each of the characters in the show have very clear defining traits that feel very human because they're not taken for granted or played as jokes, which is something How I Met Your Mother did a lot with some of its character beats. With that, Sophie lets her insecurities show. It's kind of a lot to hear that you gave up going on tour for me because it's what you've always dreamed of doing. You think I should have gone? I don't know. Maybe. If you only said no for me, and this is brand new, I mean, we don't even know if this is gonna work out. So you think I should go on tour with my ex? I read you loud and clear, Sophie. And Jesse asks her to leave. This is similar to her breaking up with Drew, but not for good reasons. When she broke up with Drew, she was being mature, she knew it was the best thing for Drew. Here, she thinks the best thing for Jesse is not committing to her. This now is due to her insecurities, and not due to her making the mature choice. She doesn't think Jesse should be with her, 
because she doesn't think she deserves that level of love and commitment. It's too scary for her. It's what she's always wanted, but getting what you've always wanted is very scary. It can make you feel like you don't deserve it. Have you ever met a totally cute, nice vice principal who wants to take you out and all you can think about is why? What's the point? If I say yes, he's inevitably just gonna turn into failed date number 89. And so Sophie needs to go somewhere to clear her head and she goes to the bar downstairs from Jesse's apartment. Jesse's apartment, which used to be the apartment in How I Met Your Mother. Love your place. Thanks, it was a total score. We got it from this old married couple who posted it on the Wesleyan alumni group. We even got them to leave their swords. Wow, nice Ooh. touch. <laughs> So she's down at McLaren's pub, the bar where most of How I Met Your Mother took place, and there she goes to order a whiskey, but she has no idea how to do it. One whiskey, please. Up, neat, and on the rocks. That is not an order that makes sense. I, I don't actually know how to order whiskey. It's just been a day, and it seems like the kind of thing that people order when they're feeling a little extra. Good extra or bad extra? So Sophie recognizes Robin, saying she's a big fan of hers, which makes a lot of sense considering how famous Robin was by that point. You're everywhere. I am not everywhere. Okay, I'm some places. And so Sophie asks. A big famous reporter wants to hear about my stupid love life. Very, very much, actually. My friends and I wasted years in this very bar talking about our stupid love lives. I stop in here whenever I'm in the neighborhood. So. Please, tell me your stupid love story. Bring me back to the good old days. Now, I'm not one to like fan service a lot. Usually it feels very cheap. There is a good reason why I dislike Spider-Man No Way Home. But the way this show integrates Robin here is great. She's at the bar she used to hang out at for most of her adult life to remember the good memories she made. And that makes perfect sense for her character at that point in her life, with her having divorced Barney and being in love with Ted, but he's together with Tracy by that point. She's also a famous reporter now who travels a lot, so she can barely hang out with the group like she used to. She got the successful career she always wanted, but she lost her friends and her husband due to it. She wants to recapture the feeling of being young and having her whole life ahead of her. How much her mother never established, Robin hung out at McLaren's alone, whenever the group wasn't there, after Ted met Tracy, but it makes perfect sense for her character. Obviously, her being here and meeting Sophie is fan service, but it's in a way that adds to Robin's character and keeps consistent with the original show. So Sophie tells Robin the story of her and Jesse. Now, of all the people for Sophie to have met, she met Robin, the person who went out and is still in love with Ted, the guy who said, I love you, on their first date. Hearing Robin's perspective, especially by this point in her life where she's realized how much she appreciates Ted's romantic side, is very interesting. We just got together, and now he's turning down tours for me and dropping sleep I love you's? Like, it, it's too much too soon. I once had a guy say I love you on our first date. There's no better character from the original show to return for an episode like this. The writers knew what they were doing when writing this episode. So Robin, with all the knowledge she gained from How I Met Your Mother, lays down some wisdom on Sophie. The dude sounds like a real piece of work. You have no idea. <laughs> but a good piece of work. Robin went through so much from ending relationships to pursue her career to rejecting career opportunities to pursue relationships. She has all this experience and, at this point in her life, looking back, what is the conclusion she would have? Sophie, I have been married, I've been single, I have been everything in between. And the only decisions I regret making are the ones I made out of fear. The conclusion is that fear is the worst obstacle to face. In How Much Your Mother, her fear got in the way of her wanting to have a family, of committing to being with Ted, of furthering her career at points, and Robin has seen how fear has gotten in the way of some of her friends' lives too, causing issues between Marshall and Lily, Ted's career being stuck in place, Barney not wanting to commit to anyone and having a real relationship until very late into his life, so she knows the effects fear can have on someone. So she knows that fighting that fear is the best thing you can do. Do not waste your time being scared, Sophie. Fear can make you run away from things that could be good, great even, things that are supposed to be a part of your story. Really think about it. What did Jesse do wrong other than say everything you ever wanted a guy to say just faster than you expected? Nothing. So this episode with their conversation isn't really characterizing Sophie. We got all the character we needed for this scene to exist. What it's doing, it's characterizing Robin with her point of view post Ted meeting Tracy and using Robin to teach a lesson to Sophie to face her fears, which Sophie was already getting better at doing as the season progressed. Getting this final push from Robin is a very special moment because the big payoff to Sophie committing to confronting her fears comes from all the wisdom acquired from a character who we've seen why they'd have this outlook on life, 
someone whose advice here makes sense with what they've been through. It's just nice to understand how Robin's character would have this knowledge and would be able to use it to help Sophie. When she's facing the same insecurities, Robin always faced about commitment. Time travel 20 years into the future and ask future you, future me, what do I wish I'd done 20 years ago the night I met smoking hot yet somehow still full of gravitas news superstar Robin Scherbatsky? And whatever future you says, do that. Okay. I've got to go talk to Jesse. In that dialogue, they also added a little reference to the episode Time Travelers of How Much Your Mother that starts with the same thing being said to Ted, that he'd regret not going out to have fun with Barney that night in 20 years, which is a nice touch that Robin would follow that philosophy of Barney's. So Sophie goes back up to Jesse's place, but she sees Jesse kissing Meredith. This is a pretty classic sitcom trope, season one of Friends ends that same way, with Rachel finally wanting to be with Ross after Ross was pining for her the whole season, but Ross shows up with a girlfriend. It's not my favorite trope, just having conflict be created by the fact that one character took too long to do something. Like Sophie here took too long to realize she was being silly, but I think it works quite well just on the level of there actually being consequences to her insecurities getting the better of her in this episode. But I especially think it works because of what happens right after Sophie sees that. She goes down to the bar and tells Robin what she saw and Robin says, Maybe he's not such a bad guy, this Jesse. If I've learned anything at all about love, it's that timing is everything. And sometimes, timing's a bitch. Here, we basically get the point of the episode, which is also the name of the episode. Timing is everything. The last lesson Robin imparts in this episode is one she learned the hard way, when she was in love with Barney back in episode 1 of season 7 of Our Metro Mother. If you have chemistry, you only need one other thing. What's that? Timing. But timing's a bitch. For the entirety of How I Met Your Mother, Robin missed out on many relationships because of timing. So her telling Sophie that some things are just out of her control is bittersweet, as it's comforting to know not everything is down to you, down to whether Sophie makes the right decision or not. But also it takes away a sort of agency that makes the chaos of life hard to live through, which is what happened to Robin and why she's trying to relive the best moments of her life, back when she thought she could control that chaos. You're gonna be okay. I promise. I do. But I'll meet future you back here in 20 years for a drink, just to make sure. It's a date. This is the last we see of Robin, I hope forever, unless we see her like in the finale of the show, with Sophie telling her about how everything did work out in the end, and I think everything we had with Robin was truly great. We get so much from Robin as a character here, we completely understand everything she tells Sophie, and it characterizes Robin in this period that the original show rushed through. It feels like a very fitting ending for Robin's character considering what we know comes after this and what came before. So Sophie goes to the exhibition where her photo was being shown, trying to keep her mind off Jesse. Now, before I say how the season ends, I need to backtrack a little bit. Another use of fan service this season was in episodes 9 and 10, where future Sophie was telling a weird story about this married couple getting a divorce. The couple is the Captain and Becky, two characters from How I Met Your Mother. The Captain cheated on Becky and she was asking for a divorce, and in the divorce, she wanted to get all of the captain's boats and destroy them, the one thing that would truly hurt the captain. If you've not watched How Much Your Mother, just trust me that this makes sense. Now, even though this is a more surface level use of fan service, it serves its purpose really well, because at least the show is using an established character in this universe to achieve what it needs to with the boats. Ultimately, the point we need to make with the captain and Becky is this. You can have all the boats, but not the one in Australia. What those marine biologists are doing down there is important. Now, if you remember the start of this video, I mentioned that Sophie met Ian in episode 1, the guy she thought would be the perfect guy for her. But he had to go to Australia for work. Ian is a marine biologist. Becky getting the captain's boats means that Ian's work stops. Weird. That guy. He looks just like... Yeah. The point the episode is making is that timing is everything when it comes to love, the point Robin learned 10 years ago. And so timing with Becky and the captain getting a divorce, and Sophie being single again, lines up perfectly to bring Ian back into Sophie's life and allow them to get into a relationship. Hi. Is this a good time? As a setup for the next season, it's pretty solid to have Sophie with her dream guy and Jesse with who he always thought was the love of his life. I do think Jesse and Sophie will get together by the end of the show, but the setup works wonders for the point about timing that the show wants to make, but just also helps not end the season in the sad note of Sophie being alone and not with Jesse. Using Robin's idea of timing, that was such a cynical idea back in How I Met Your Mother due to the hopelessness she felt by that point, and making it so timing it isn't just a bad thing, 
It's really good to incorporate that idea, but still keep in line with the thing both shows wanted to get across. Hopefulness. Ted never gave up on how I met your mother, and eventually things work out for everyone in the group. So keeping that hope that things will work out for everyone and how I met your father is a great way to end the season. Kind of like how in season 8 of how I met your mother ends with Ted at his most hopeless. But the final scene is the mother, Tracy, buying a train ticket to Robin's wedding. Showing us that Ted might feel hopeless and alone, but that very soon he's going to meet the love of his life. Now, you may have noticed I basically only talked about Jesse and Sophie when I was mentioning episodes 8, 9, and 10. And that's because the main story of these episodes is relating to those two. But obviously, this is an ensemble show and there are B and C plots I want to mention relating to the other characters. Valentina, Charlie, Ellen, and Sid. So let's dive into those real quick. Don't worry, this won't take nearly as long as the Jesse and Sophie stories. I really like that. In the beginning of episode 8, we have Jesse and Sid sharing a few inside jokes. I finally laid down some new tracks without Meredith. Matt! J Jesse, I am so proud of you, man. Can I kiss your forehead? You better. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you're so psyched for me because I did max out all my credit cards on studio time and I'm gonna be late on rent this month. But, do you need any more back rub coupons? No, Jesse, I got plenty of back rub coupons, okay. man. Which reminds me of the inside joke Valentina and Sophie shared in episode 5. You go get a drink with my mom. I'm gonna grill my teenage stepdad. <gasps> teenage stepdad would be a great Nickelodeon show, right? Let's add it to the Google Doc. Because these little interactions are really good at building a natural impression that these people have been friends for a long time, which is especially necessary to separate Valentina and Sophie and Sid and Jesse from the rest of the group, who don't really share these memories and haven't been friends for that long, which also especially helps with something like the conflict I mentioned in my previous video between Ellen and Jesse, because the entire thing Ellen was dealing with in that episode was that her and Jesse weren't that close due to their parents getting divorced and them getting split apart because of it, and thus not having shared their childhood of being each other's siblings. There are many of these details that help build natural impressions of their relationships without needing to flash back to what happened before the show, like how much her mother often did. For example, one thing that's really nice as a detail is how, in episode 2, Jesse told Sophie about how when his girlfriend rejected his proposal and left him, she took his cat. She got the cat. No, not the cat. My cat, my 11 year old cat that I rescued from a shelter and named Girl so that I could call her Jessie's Girl. And now you wish that you had Jessie's Girl. And in episode 8, when Meredith comes to Sid in Jessie's apartment to talk to Jessie and he's not there, Sid answers the door and says, What are you doing here, Meredith? Shouldn't you be out rejecting the proposal of a young lover and then fleeing to Europe with his cat? I really like this because obviously Jessie's cat being taken is something that really hurt him, as we know from episode 2. So Sid being his best friend, mentioning the cat like that, shows how much he has Jesse's back, and also knows what to say to Meredith about part of what hurt Jesse. So this joke works because it's bitter about something that seems weird to mention, but it is in character, because it showcases how Sid and Jesse tell each other this stuff, which is an indication of how close they are as friends. In episode 9, Sid and his fiancée Hannah are trying to plan their two weddings. If you remember earlier, Sid wanted to have a wedding in India, to celebrate with the people he grew up with, and one in America. But an issue arises when Sid says that Sophie kissing Jesse while dating Drew is okay. Sophie cheated on Drew. Oh, I mean, yeah, but she's gonna end things today. And besides, this is the good kind of cheating. Which causes Hannah to get mad at Sid for most of the episode. It's cheating that leads to something good. like. Finding your person or Beyonce's lemonade. Yeah, great. Amazing to know that I'm planning a wedding with a man who is so supportive of cheating. Now, I get why Hannah might feel this way, but she knows Sid will never cheat on her. So this conflict is rooted in something else. As we'll find out when Hannah goes talk this out with Sid, this is based on the recurring issue of their long distance relationship which has been explored for the whole season, that they find it hard being apart and keeping their relationship alive. Sometimes I worry how much our relationship can stand. Which, as I've mentioned time and time again, is a very human, very natural thing for people to struggle with if they are in situations like this. Long distance relationships are hard and this show is exploring that way better than how much your mother ever did when Ted was dating Victoria and she was in Germany. Because we see both sides of the relationship and we see the compromises the two have to make to be able to be together and we see them constantly addressing the strains in their relationship and figuring out ways to work them out. So the reason Hannah got so bent on a shape here was because she loves Sid so much that she finds it hard being apart from him, and her being afraid that that time apart will somehow be too much for their relationship to take, and Sid feels the same way. Sometimes, I miss you so much. I sit on my own hand until it goes numb, and then... Oh, Sid, I, I don't need to know about no, that. No. 
then I hold it and pretend it's yours, okay? For them, it's not even about their sexual relationship. They just love each other's presence and being without that is hard. Sid uses that to comfort Hannah and show that there's nothing to worry about with their relationship because they both are very clearly committed to being with each other despite how hard it is to be in a long distance relationship. It's a very great way to resolve this conflict because it was just a silly insecurity that Hannah felt over them being in that kind of relationship. However, good news is your residency is almost done. You'll be back in New York in no time. Something came up. Hannah got offered a fellowship in LA, meaning she'd have to stay another year there, in a long distance relationship with Sid. It's not just that Hannah was having worries and insecurities, but they had been exacerbated by these circumstances of wanting to do this fellowship that would probably strain their relationship even more. And, as she said, she's worried how much their relationship can take. Sid and Hannah aren't always the focus in this show, they're definitely not as much the main characters as Jesse and Sophie are, but the way their conflicts are done always makes sense with what we know of them. They're two people who love each other more than anything, and who are trying to make a long-distance relationship work until they can finally live together. They also want to support each other in everything they make, and talk out whatever issues they may have, so they can always make the other happy. So having the conflicts being, like earlier in the season, which I mentioned in my previous episode, that Sid bought that bar in New York without consulting Hannah, and that Hannah feels like Sid walks over her when he makes decisions, and that he should tell her before he makes these decisions, makes a lot of sense. Especially in the way it was shown that Sid didn't tell Hannah about the bar before doing it, because it was some insecurity and fear that was very irrational, but that was rooted in the way his life had been led by that point, of always doing things for other people when finally wanting to do something for himself. With wanting to do the second wedding, the same thing, he was worried that Hannah wouldn't understand, and his excuse was that he didn't want to put too much honor to deal with, neglecting his own feelings. So now he has to face the same thing of supporting Hannah, but spending one more year facing the hardships of their long distance relationship, or doing something for himself, being selfish. So episode 10 has him supporting Hannah, at first, then we see them talking to a wedding planner and he sees how expensive the two weddings would be. But you're the one who wanted a second international wedding. Yeah, when I thought our lives were about to get way less expensive. Like Hannah, I thought we were gonna live in one city and share one apartment. I support you, but we both know doing this for another year, it's, it sounds hard as hell. Sounds like you're not even sure we should be planning one wedding, let alone two. Basically, him supporting Hannah comes to a breaking point because it's causing a direct issue of them not being able to pay for their weddings. However, the next time we see them, at the end of the episode, they're already married. We're married! <laughs> the weddings were just getting so stressful and expensive, we were like, you know what, let's just go to City Hall, get it done. Now, with the two having to always find a compromise to make the other happy, it is interesting to think where this may go going forward. Especially as they're now married, but in season 2, Hannah will be doing that fellowship and so their feelings of being apart and always trying to find a solution to support the other in spite of how they feel themselves could come to the surface. But for now, I do really appreciate how their relationship is built on this trust and love for each other to just talk things out and always trying to find ways to support the other no matter what. It's very good to see a relationship of two people so committed to each other like this, though it's clear why these two couldn't lead the show on their own, with their conflicts being so easy and simple to resolve in this sense, but it's also good that it ends with a resolution that, at the same time, can set up many conflicts throughout the next season over this very thing. Sid and Hannah as characters are somewhat basic, but I appreciate their existence in this show, and their love for each other being so strong is very heartwarming to see. Talking about Ellen will be very quick, because her character doesn't get that much attention, which is a shame, because she's kind of like Phoebe in Friends. She has a very interesting personality, and her character has a lot of baggage from her life to work through, but she doesn't get as much focus as the other characters. In episode 8, she has no character development, she's there with Sid, trying to keep Meredith from talking to Jesse. In episode 9, she figures out what clothes to wear for a job interview, and she has awful taste, but Valentina helps her. In episode 10, she has a very small story of how her job interview went horribly, in a very sitcom way. I'm Mark, the lead produce buyer. Lead produce buyer? So you're like the head of lettuce? <laughs> you know, the head of lettuce? With the interviewer not getting her joke. Then there's the fact she found a cat outside her building and she thought it could be her emotional support animal, but it seems to hate her. Then she meets the girl, who she lied about knowing her grandma to get a date with her earlier in the season. Basically, a bunch of bad things happen to her, but it turns out the cat was that girl's and so she gives her the cat back. Then the girl says that they deserve a second chance, so now they're dating. And the interviewer from earlier calls Ellen to tell her, I just got your joke. I'm the head of lettuce. <laughs> 
You're hilarious. <laughs> I'm offering you the job. Now, this is extremely minimal, but I do like this little arc she goes through in this episode because she was ready to give up the cat and to admit her life sucks after being beaten down so much this episode, and the entire season for that matter. But her getting a bunch of good news to lift her spirits is a nice resolution to show that her optimism throughout the season, despite her circumstances, was warranted, because it'll all work out in the end, much like Robin had said to Sophie earlier in the episode. Now, these two have probably the most interesting relationship in the show to me. They're the way less traditional and basic characters of the bunch, and their stories are handled with a very interesting point of view of the two being so different but being able to find each other in each other. So I mentioned in the previous video how Valentina was afraid of committing to being with Charlie because of her fear of losing her independence, but she also found that being with Charlie was exciting with how the two were always making the other find out new stuff about themselves, and how Valentina is especially helping Charlie find out who he is outside of his family and in this brand new city, having to actually live a normal life. I truly love this idea of a relationship to be explored in a show, and every scene with the two reinforces those ideas really well. So in episode 8, we have Valentina hating her job and being very mistreated by her boss, so she steals a very expensive bag from her job to take to Drew's charity event. However, her boss realizes the bag went missing and so she has to get the bag back somehow when someone had won it in the auction. So Charlie goes and steals the bag from the lady that won it and runs out with it with Valentina. That's all they have this episode, but at least he keeps consistent with the idea of the two forcing each other out of their comfort zone for the other, showing their love and dedication and how them being the least normal characters of the group has them acting crazy for each other. Not in destructive ways, but in exciting ways, that have them being happy for facing certain fears and showing their love for each other, so much so that they get very excited after Charlie steals the bag. Oh, I love you, Bonnie. I love you more, Clyde. <laughs> Don't mind them, they're in the middle of some very intense outlawing roleplay. Showing the excitement of their relationship perfectly. It's a pretty surface level arc for these two this episode, but sometimes the surface level stories are important too, to help show the continuous story arc of the season without taking too much focus away from other important things. In episode 9, Charlie starts the episode with his planned Friends Soccer Day, the day he'd planned to watch football with the group so they could love it as much as he does. However, when they get to the bar and he wants to watch the match, Jesse and Sophie Sophie aren't even there, as they're dealing with Meredith and Drew. Meanwhile, none of the group that is there pays attention to the game, with Sid and Hannah planning their weddings, Ellen trying to figure out what to wear for her job interview, and Valentina talking about Jesse and Sophie with the group, helping Ellen choose what clothes to wear, and calling Sophie to tell her Jesse was talking to Meredith. They all miss the game, and Charlie watches it on his own. Charlie expresses his disappointment to Valentina. But that game is the only connection that I have to home right now. And yes, I was hoping that I could share it with everyone and that for just one day I would forget that I'm thousands of miles away from everything that I've ever known. Charlie, I had no idea you were homesick. I like that Charlie caring about football was made to be about his character more than just wanting them to watch it with him. As someone who loves football, I don't care if my friends or family watch it with me, and I imagine the same is true for Charlie, but all he wanted was for them to enjoy the game with him, because he feels homesick, and he wanted to feel like he was home with his friends cheering and watching the game with him. It's a really nice way to add some depth to his character and create some conflict with Valentina. With that, Valentina tries to apologize to Charlie and make him feel at home, in a very Valentina way, decorating his place full of British stuff, dressing as all the Spice Girls at once, making a reference to a British rom-com to apologize to Charlie and show how much she cares about him. I get that you miss watching it with your family and... Who knows, maybe one day we'll have a bunch of rugrats of our own to watch soccer with. Showing she's thinking of their future, and she's willing to watch football with Charlie if it makes him happier. I really love the resolution in this episode because the conflict between them is caused by basically it being the B-plot of the episode. It's just not something the show wants to focus on because the characters don't want to focus on it. They all said this friend's soccer day sounded boring, but the writers turned that into conflict by showing how the lack of attention given to something Charlie cares about hurts him by introducing a feeling that only he could have in this show. It's missing his home, missing his country, having to face living in a completely new place and not having any of the comfort of his life in England. So the resolution is Valentina showing she cares about Charlie enough to care about what he cares about and apologizing for not taking him seriously before. Her understanding Charlie's feelings and knowing that if something is important to Charlie, it must be important for her. However, what I also love is that the show also turns the resolution of this conflict into a new conflict between these two characters. As I showed, Valentina mentioned having kids. Maybe one day we'll have a bunch of rugrats of our own to watch soccer with. 
Oh. I know, I know. I never say anything that corny, but you were gone for a while, so I spiked the tea. And I drank most of it. Which is a very harmless sign of love and appreciation to Charlie, showing she sees a future with him and that she loves him enough to want to have kids with him. But Charlie freaks out about this in episode 10 because he never wanted to have kids. The conflict in episode 10 ends up being that Charlie, due to how terrible his mom was to him, never wanted to have kids. You're a bossy narcissist with a sentimental streak. Oh, I know. I mean, on paper, I'm a born parent. It's just having children turn my mother into a mean, spiteful woman, and I want to be kind and generous. But Valentina really does want to have children. I know kids seem very off-brand for me, but I want it all. It's not contradicting anything of her established character. It actually makes sense when you consider her reasoning. I want it all. A big career, a big love story, and a big family. Valentina wanting to be a star, wanting to have a great life and do everything she sets her mind to is definitely part of her character. And having kids is part of that everything for her. So these two clash, in one wanting to have kids and the other not in a very natural way. And they end up breaking up due to that difference in views. I'm very curious how they'll continue with these two characters in season 2. I hope they don't get back together because them having these different views on having kids is definitely something that impedes their relationship from moving forward. And despite the fact that Charlie's hangups on having children can be worked on, I hope they don't have him change his mind because the existence of these multiple points of view is really great and I'd love to see Valentina and Charlie being friends after their breakup and being happy for each other without being in a relationship because it's what those two characters would do if Charlie never changes his mind. So I really like the way their relationship went in season 1 because we see it being developed really well, until it gets to a point where it's so developed that Valentina can see an actual future with it, and that causes an issue in their relationship that ends it, without undermining either character for why they'd want to end the relationship. Now, after Valentina broke up with Charlie, there's one more scene with her that I love, after Sid and Hannah say they're married, they all go celebrate and Valentina asks Sophie where Jesse is. He's... He's not coming. So, what happened? Um... Not tonight. And Sophie tries talking about something else to take her mind off the thing making her sad, saying Sid and Hannah look very happy, and she says that maybe Valentina and Charlie are next. I don't think so. We broke up. Not tonight. Tonight we celebrate my friend Sophie, the most talented photographer in New York City. I really love this quiet moment between these two because it's just so human. Ellen is extremely happy, Sin and Hannah are amazingly happy. Sophie should be really happy. They don't want to ruin any of it. So they just confide in each other that they are going through something emotional, but both knowing to not let it get in the way of that night. It's amazing and something that can only be achieved with these two characters being able to say so much to each other with so few words, being so close friends, which is helped by their chemistry being great and just both actors being phenomenal with their subtlety and their acting. This all works so well because these two have a deal to always be honest with each other. So them wanting to keep their bad situations off their minds for that night, but still knowing they have to tell the other what's going on, is a really nice way to show the strength of their relationship. It reminds me of this moment from How I Met Your Mother. In a moment like that, when what's really happening is too intense to deal with, sometimes it's best... to leave it unspoken and just enjoy each other's company instead. So, I really, really loved How I Met Your Father Season 1. My first video was mostly praising how the show introduced these characters and their traits, and managed to use them for very well done conflict in those episodes, but this video was more so showing how the established characters were developed and changed throughout the season in very natural ways with their characterization. For a 10 episode season, it's really impressive how well you get to know these characters. Even if I wish they had focused more on Ellen and Sid, but considering season 2 would be a 20 episode season, I have high hopes they'll get plenty of time in it. So the verdict is that How Much Your Father Season 1 not only is a really good season of TV, but also that it gets better with each episode, and it told a very compelling story that really focuses on the characters being allowed to be who they are, and most of the conflicts and resolutions coming from these characters remaining consistent with their characterization, while all of them also learn and grow through the course of the season. For a show that I was expecting so little from, I really care about all the characters in the cast, each for their own unique reasons, and I know I've made this comparison a few times, but the character writing really does remind me of Community, with how efficient and effortless the characterization is done, 
though it's not as amazing as community or even as funny for that matter. I also really want to praise the acting in the show. It's hard to point out how good acting is without going into too much detail, so I'll just make some general statements about it. But not only is everyone really good with their comedic timing and deliveries, when they need to be more emotional and have a little more depth to their characters, they all nail it, especially Valentina's actress, Francia Riza. Like in episode 6 when she says I love you to Charlie for the first time. I... Love you. She looks so fucking vulnerable when saying it, like she's never said it before, which the character she's playing hasn't said it before, and you can see how terrified she is of being so in love with someone. I'm really excited for season 2, and I hope it doesn't use its edit episodes to lose focus of its story and go wild like How I Met Your Mother did. As someone who doesn't think How I Met Your Mother is a good show, the worry that this spinoff will try to become How I Met Your Mother with the style of comedy and absurd sitcom logic is always gonna be there for me. But season 1 was so heavily focused on the very grounded and more serious characterization of these characters than just trying to be funny that I've got really high hopes for it. So we'll see how well the show continues to be moving forward. Now the video is basically over, uh, you can leave if you like, but I noted down a lot of details that I really liked about season 1 that I wanted to mention, but I couldn't fit within the video, so I'm gonna point them out now before I finish it. So in episode 2, there's a moment where Valentine is talking about how Ian didn't want to do a long distance relationship with Sophie, and she calls it LDR, which confuses Jesse, but you can see Ellen mouthing long distance relationship to Jesse to explain what LDR means, and I find that really adorable. At the end of episode 5, future Sophie's son asks why she told the story of that episode if it was all about Sophie's mom rather than having anything to do with how Sophie met the dad, and I really love the answer she gives. But I couldn't eventually wind up with your dad until I face my stuff with my mom. Firstly, because it makes perfect sense with how Sophie had to get over her insecurities about dating, which are rooted in her relationship with her mom, but also because episodes like this that have little to do with actually getting to the road of meeting the father still have a point, because the road to Sophie meeting the love of her life only happened the way it did because she was the person she needed to be when she met him, so that she could be with him properly. Much like how Ted says in episode 1 of season 3 of How I Met Your Mother, There's more than one story of how I met your mother. You know the short version, the thing with your mom's yellow umbrella? But there's a bigger story, the story of how I became who I had to become before I could meet her. However, the finale of How I Met Your Mother contradicts this point to make Ted get together with Robin. You mean to sit down and listen to the story about how you met mom? Yet mom is hardly in the story. No. This is a story about how you're totally in love with Aunt Robin. So as long as How Much Your Father doesn't do the same stupid thing, I'm really happy with us having episodes that focus on Sophie growing as a person regardless of it having any direct impact on her meeting the dad. Because the point is that how she grew to become who she needed to be to be with the dad is the important part of the story. Not just how they met, like Ted says the yellow umbrella story is how he met Tracy, but it's only the story of how he physically met her, not how he became who he needed to be to meet her. In line with that, I like that Sophie's son gets more and more invested in the story his mom's telling him throughout the season. Why are you telling me about this cheating couple and their weird boat kinks? We left off on a cliffhanger kiss. Look who wants to hear about his mom hooking up now. Despite him thinking it'd be annoying at the start of the season. The show being so much about hope and love Having something like that fits thematically way better than Ted's kids and how much her mother always being disinterested in his stories and being so cynical. Also, I really like this detail in episode Holy 6. Holy shit, it's the man in the yellow tie. Wait, why is it brown? Also in episode 6, Drew getting mad at himself for saying something corny is very Josh from Drake and Josh, and I appreciate being reminded of my childhood. I am gonna freshen up real quick so our night can begin. That was so lame. Can I take that back? Uh-huh. Great. See you soon. You're an idiot. Be sexy. But it also works with this character being so mature that he doesn't know how to be looser and funnier or sexier, like he said in episode 4. This whole, like, being super mature thing, it's, um... Yeah, it's not all it's cracked up to be. And sometimes I feel like I missed out. You know? I'm having those ridiculous nights that you look back on when you're old. In episode 8, Drew's reaction to what Sophie says about trying to take a picture of her raccoon is hilarious and adorable. Any luck getting your perfect picture? Not yet. I almost got one of a cat and a raccoon being interspecies friends, but then it turned out the cat was dead and the raccoon was eating it. 
Oh, ew. In episode 9, Valentina heating her coffee on the broken heat pipe is hilarious, as it was established that pipe was broken in episode 4 and they hadn't had time or money to get it fixed. <laughs> And I especially like this detail because it's not called attention to, it's just a visual gag. Sun is out! Birds are singing! My new tooth is ready to chomp! That you'll appreciate by having paid attention to the show and knowing they established the pipe being broken and noticing that Valentina is using it in the background. I also really like this joke from Valentina in episode 9. Tell me about the kiss. Is he a tongue swirler? Lip fighter? Oh, did you do that creepy thing where you keep your eyes open? I like to see if my partners are enjoying themselves. Is that so bad? <laughs> yes, it's like kissing an American Girl doll, and I would know. Felicity and I got down. Because it's a good example of how the jokes mostly come from the characters just acting in character. It's their personalities being used to craft a joke that fits with the scene. As Valentina's personality of being wild and kind of vulgar, especially when she's talking to Sophie, who is very basic, as Valentina would say, her jokes come from her saying some unexpected things. Because she knows she's always had this vibrant and eccentric personality, and she can also make fun of Sophie while doing that. It, it's great. And that's it. That's all I have to say about How My Your Father Season 1. Well, not really. I could easily write a video twice as long and talk about some of the stuff with the first six episodes that I appreciated a lot on rewatch. But this video is huge already, so let's see each other again to talk about How I Met Your Father once Season 2 ends. Or maybe later, I clearly procrastinate a lot considering when I originally said I'd start working on this video. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, I'd really appreciate it if you left a like or a comment in this video, or if you could subscribe as well. As it truly was a lot of work I put into for a project, I did not expect to get this big. I hope to see y'all next time. Goodbye. However, as you may remember, Meredith... Meredith, 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 however, as you may remember, Meredith, Meredith, Meredith wanting to tell Jessie about her new song, 